and welcome to another episode of the Ali Show. And today we have a very special guest, a stunt woman, Bronte Coluccio. Did I get your last name right? Coluccio, Italian. Oh, Coluccio. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Close. Thanks for having me. Pretty close. Um. Anyway, Bronte, how have you been? Pretty good. Happier that we're out of lockdown and back to normal life. Or oh, almost. Almost, I would say it's still not really like quite there yet. Oh, it's still better than most countries, I'd say, right now. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, you look around the world, what's happening, like, you know, this, I think it's more than just COVID, you know. Oh, definitely. And like, um, man, talking about stuff around the world, like, you look at the, um, you know, the elections and all that that's happening in the US, that's pretty crazy. Uh, I've got a lot of friends that are in LA and Atlanta uh, right now and some in New York and they are keeping me very up to date with the happenings, but I'm pretty sure there was a lot of celebrating. Yeah, I think <laughs> that, that's, oh man, okay, we, sorry we have to get a little bit into this, <laughs> but uh, off, off topic, but it doesn't matter, we can talk about whatever we want, right? <laughs> um, yeah, about your friends who are there, like, um, you know, they're saying they're celebrating, but like, one thing that has me a little bit confused is, are they celebrating because Trump is no longer the president? Or are they celebrating because Biden won? Because that guy's not really a role model as well. I think it's more celebrating that Trump's no longer president. Mm. Yeah. How much do you know about like Joe Biden and his background and like stuff like that? And not too mm. much at all. Yeah. Not too much yeah. at all. Yeah. I've been trying to stay removed from it. <laughs> yeah, I know. As much as <laughs> as much as we want to try to not get like involved in it, but you you know it, there are certain things that come to your attention and yeah. some things that your you know your friends or whatever that put online and you get you are made aware of this stuff. Um, you know, someone said to me the other day like you know it's it's just a matter of cho choosing the lesser of two evils, but like I don't really get that like. Why are we, why is it that, you know, people are being put in a situation where they have to choose that? Like, Between the two evils, yeah. To, to represent them or to lead them or to like, you know, make big decisions in the world, which is... It's just money. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It comes anyway, down to money over there. Let's not, uh, <laughs> let's not get into the, uh, the whole <laughs> politics, politics talk. And then we're going to drift into like conspiracy theories. <laughs> 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 That's really crazy. But anyway, let's not, let's not go there. Um... Anyway, um, you've actually, we're here at your uh, gym um, where you coach at. Um, mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about this place? Yeah, so right now we're at Aspire Aerobics. That's an aerobics studio mm. based in Auckland. And we coach aerobic gymnastics here as well as like tumbling and gymnastics. Um, yeah, aerobic gymnastics is quite an uncommon gym sport. Not many people know about it. It's the one that's on the wooden floor. No, we don't use ribbons, balls, hoops. We're not on the bar or the beam. We're on the floor. And uh, it's a combo of dance and gymnastics skill. And we actually have a bunch of athletes that unfortunately missed out on the world championships this year because COVID. Mm, so um, can't travel and... New Zealand is very doing very well mm. in that sport. The other thing you mentioned about like it being on a wooden floor, like on the wooden floor, uh, yeah, which obviously means also it's going to hurt a lot more if you yeah, chisel. just <laughs> don't make mistakes and you'll be right. Oh, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know about not making uh mistakes, but like you know, it, it, accidents do happen, and if it does and you do take a fall, I reckon it's going to hurt pretty bad, but yeah, this is um, true. Uh, in the interesting thing you were telling me about it is. Um, just off camera before, but how it's um, actually not in the Olympic um, roster. Yeah, could, you, could you just tell us a little bit? Yeah. I don't want to butcher any of the information <laughs> that you, you told me, but yeah. So it's not hey, you. in Olympic. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this video. It's not an Olympic sport. Uh, basically, the reasoning we've been told is that the Olympic schedule for gymnastics is full. So gymnastics is given so much time and they are allowed to fill it how they choose. So you've got artistic gymnastics, rhythmic gymnastics, acrobatic gymnastics, trampolining. Then you've got aerobics, now cheerleading and parkour also under the gymnastics umbrella. So there's only so much space at the Olympics for gym sports. Um, and unfortunately, aerobics doesn't make the cut in that. So if mm. if we want to be one, they have to choose a sport to cut down on in participation to allow us to compete. Yeah, one of the funny things about talking about the Olympics as well, like um, 
there there has been some talks that I've been listening to recently about how it's like it's pretty the Olymp okay, the Olympics committee or the whole thing actually makes a lot of money, right? Yeah. They make a lot of money. Like this someone has I, I don't know the exact numbers, but someone has actually gone into it and looked into this stuff, right? There's a lot of money that is made in this whole thing. But strange enough, like people don't the athlete don't make any money from it. None at all. At all. And all of our gymnasts in New Zealand are fully self funded. Yeah, which which basically means <laughs> Because the gymnasts usually start at a young age, so which also means that your parents got to support what you want to do and be of a certain financial position to be able to put you for this stuff. Because yeah. from what I understand, it's not cheap as well. No, not unless you can... Like when we were kids, we did so much fundraising and standing on street corners and trying to sell things and earn money to travel overseas. But it really... Our parents did support us a lot. And it's definitely limiting. Um, some areas of New Zealand are better. Like I know down in Southland, there's more funding for sports and things. Mm-hmm. So depending on where you're from, mm-hmm. can also really make a difference. So yeah, based on where you are around the country, mm-hmm. uh, can help with funding as well. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, let's let's get a bit uh, into how you got into aerobic gymnastics. So when did you get into that, and like how did you get into that? I started in aerobic gymnastics when I was eight years old. So I moved over from Australia. I know, forgive me, I was born in Sydney. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with that. I I live in New Zealand. I get a lot of hate. (laughs) Usually there's... there's, (laughs) Usually they do that, eh? but okay, it's fine. You can be from anywhere in the world, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Yeah, so my family moved to New Zealand when I was six years old and I started in Irish dancing of all things. Wow. Yep, I did that for four years and we did some big shows at the AOTA Centre and stuff, but I wasn't very flexible. So to improve my flexibility for dance, uh, my parents found a gymnastics club near us and entered me in gymnastics so Mm. I could get more flexible. And when I was there, I saw kids doing aerobics and I thought that looked way cooler than what I was doing. Yeah. And so next minute I was signed up in aerobics. <laughs> and what's funny is I hated it to start. Like oh, I found man. it so confusing and so hard. And like I came home from the first training crying and then my parents were like, no, we've paid for the term. Just <laughs> like, <laughs> You're going to have to do it whether you like it or not. Oh, man. And by the end of the term, I loved it. And yeah. I ended up stopping Irish dancing just to pursue the aerobics. The interesting thing about like, um, what was it about, particularly about aerobic gymnastics or aerobics that you enjoy? Like, There's quite a few things I like about it. I like that it is both an individual and a team sport for starters. So you compete, it's challenging on your own, but also you compete in a team and there's that fun aspect and people around you, you're doing it with your friends. And then I like the performance aspect. I'm an absolute performer. Uh, like being on stage and things and on cameras and all that sort of stuff. Hence why I work in the industry I do now. Uh, but like you don't shy away from it, like, you know? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. I don't know why. It's, I also kind of like the pressure. Like as soon mm. as the pressure's on, I sort of thrive under it. I kind of enjoy being under a bit of pressure. Mm-hmm. I don't know why it's weird. But um, It's kind of like adrenaline. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like it's adrenaline. adrenaline rush. <laughs> I just I enjoy a bit of pressure. Mm. Performance, pressure... I liked learning new things and the fact that it is such a combination of strength and skill. Mm. So really it was coordination. It was basically everything you can think of in all the different sports combined into one. I think that's what I liked about it most. It's just it was all the aspects I liked from gymnastics, from dance, from other sports I'd tried all into one with my friends. Mm. Yeah. So... Obviously, um, you were competing a lot as well, um, and you actually represented New Zealand uh, in overseas competitions and all that. Um, could you tell us a little bit about like what it was like competing and um, stuff like that? Yeah, so I started competing internationally at a very young age. I started mm. competing internationally at 11, um, and I did five years internationally representing New Zealand. Wow. Yes, so <laughs> it was quite the experience. The first time... I competed overseas. Um, I went with my team and we got absolutely annihilated. 
Like mm. we came last in everything, first time being overseas. And we came back just realizing that uh, we need to up our game. Mm. If we want this, we need to learn. And after a couple of years, you know, we went back to that comp and we were meddling and placing really well over there. I think every every country and every international event we went to was different. It really depended on uh, the style of event, um, yeah, the countries that it was based in. So we were in Japan, Australia, and America. Uh, the American competitions absolutely loved, very friendly, but that was also because they probably had the most participants from different countries. I think they had close to 20 countries, wow. and a lot of them were South American countries, um, not many European countries at all there. But they were always fun events, but they were also massive events. So you would have at least 50 in your category. Wow. Yeah, so they were really big. So if we made it into the finals there, we were stoked. If we made it onto the podium, we were through the roof. Mm -hmm. And we actually did, the teams did make the podium a couple well, of times. Obviously, it was a lot more harder compared to like the smaller shows and the smaller events. The smaller events, just less of a vibe. You know, big mm -hmm. events, more vibe, yeah. more enjoyment, get to meet more people, experience different cultures and things like that. So we competed in Japan and it was smaller event, but much more serious and high caliber um, because it's so remote for so many people mm -hmm. to get to. There's not that many neighboring com countries to mm -hmm. Japan. Which were the, like, you, the toughest opponents, like which countries were they from, like? Is it the Asian countries or? China and Russia. Oh, yeah, it's got to be China, <laughs> China and Russia. China, Russia, Japan, mm -hmm. and um, Korea. Yeah. Those yeah, they, countries. They, they must like, um, you know, you see a lot of the, you know, videos where they start like training kids from, you know, re at, from a really young age. And yeah. like it's, they're pretty much put into like a full training camp. Yeah, from day dot. It's like, you look at like some of the stuff they're doing and like, man, it's it kind of looks like torture. Oh, honestly, <laughs> when we were kids, we were jealous of that. That's oh, <laughs> what we wanted. Wow. We wanted to be training 24-7. That was our dream. Well, I mean, also, like, the, at that time, I guess you could train, I mean, in hindsight, like, look at looking back at it now, like, at that time, you could probably have done it and have no worries and things like that. But, like, you know, in, in this day, it, when you reach a certain age, like, there's so many other things to think about. Like, you yeah. know, you got to make money, this, that, what, you got to work. And like, you're not, you don't really have the choice to do that. Like, yeah, it's so weird how you get older, but you want to kind of turn back, go yeah. back in time. And make the most of your time that you had back then. That's crazy. That's it's crazy. one thing that I have probably always been aware of is how limited time is. Mm. Like when I was a teenager, I did year nine at school and then I decided to homeschool after that because I just thought school was a waste of time. <laughs> Wow, yeah, that's that's um yeah that's a that's a big statement to put out, but um you know in in some ways I kind of agree with that. Like um, I figured it out. Like we spent an hour in assembly a week, sitting there doing nothing. Mm -hmm. You're at school for forty weeks a year. That's forty hours of your life. You're sitting in assembly. Wasted. Yeah. You could have worked that whole week and actually earned money. Once you put together five years at college, that's five weeks worth of work. It is that you've spent sitting on a floor listening but not only that i think the other one okay maybe the thing it also helps that um you know you are of a you have a certain iq level you know like it, <laughs> that really does help as well because not everybody learns at the same pace you know yeah but i think one of the other things that like it's oh man i have gotta be careful <laughs> with what i say you know like uh might offend some people but no i mean like um Sometimes when some people learn at a faster rate, um, when you got to make compromises to go with like the slower ones, I, I feel like it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a waste of time. Uh, but not only that, like um, you kind of get demotivated, you know, like... Yeah, when you've got 30 people in a class, like there's no way a teacher can accommodate 30 different learning styles and 30 different learning paces. So there's going to be some accommodations made and there's going to be people that are having to try and catch up and there's mm -hmm. people that are being held back no matter no matter what's happening. So yeah, I just and preferred to yeah, which do is, it at my own Yeah, which rate. is pretty cool, which how you kind of decided that you wanted to, you know, do the whole homeschool thing. And... Mm -hmm. 
how how was that how was that whole experience? But were your parents were like they were open to it or how was so that? So like? what had happened is my brother had had a real bad experience through schooling. So he wasn't an academic. Not that he wasn't smart. He just didn't like study. Yeah. Um, and so my mum had been a teacher and a principal before and had run a college over in Sydney. And so she was just looking at other options for my brother because she's like, it's just, as as a young teenage guy, he just wasn't getting what he needed out of school. And she kind of got fed up with it. So she found the homeschooling program we were doing. And my brother started on it first. And I was always like, never, never going to do that. That's so lame. I mm. love school. I love my friends. Mm. And then after two years of watching him do it, I was just like, that's such a good life. <laughs> like I wanted it what he a... had. <laughs> and so it wasn't, um, our mum never taught us. Our dad never taught us. It was mm. all correspondence schooling. So we get sent the work. We sit there, we study. And we did have to do like a couple of um like educational workshops and things to make sure that we were doing the study correctly and that we were administering the test correctly and all that sort of thing. Um, and we had to like submit essays and all that mm. sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah, which is which is quite funny because like I found when I did it, like the times where I did learn anything was like on my own, like not really in lectures or stuff like that. Because mm. half the time you at lectures, you're probably asleep anyway. You know what or I mean? Or you're just and like typing whatever they say, but not actually retaining it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that was the one that got to me was like, I felt like I, it was just, um, well, in the beginning, I felt like I wasted a lot of time sitting in lectures because I just fell asleep, you know, like the, uh, <laughs> the lecture was just not engaging and, you know, it was just real mundane and like, yeah. man, I don't know how, you know, people can continue to force themselves to stay awake and sit, you know, well, there are some things you might benefit from, but like, I felt basically just reading from the, the slides and like, you know, stuff like that. So after a while, I just didn't, I didn't, didn't go to lectures. Lecture. Yeah. Cause it doesn't make any sense, you know, but what I hate, what I hated was the fact that some places they actually penalize you for not coming to the lectures, yeah. but it's done because I could probably be learning the same thing on my own. So, yeah. the, and there might be people who are sitting there who are not learning anything at all. You know, they're either on their phones or they're asleep. And if they're not learning anything, what's the point? Yeah. You know? Um, I fully agree with that. Yeah. Which, which, I mean, you're talking about going into like the education system. It's a big topic altogether, but yeah, like, you know, um, I, I think it's that's so cool, like, because um, where I was from, like, homeschooling wasn't a thing, you know? Yeah. It was, like, more of the Western world, and, like, it was so cool. I was always intrigued by it. I was like, man, what are they doing? Like, We how... were always shot down for it. So I got bullied a fair bit for wanting to homeschool and mm. stepping away from school, and there were people coming up to my parents being like, aren't you worried for their future? You know, how are they going to get into university and all that sort of thing? Because it was so uncommon at the time. And then here we are, COVID hits and every child is homeschooling. And it's like, now you see. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know, and but it's, it's, it's real funny. Like, why would they say that uh, you, you're you not, you know, why are they worried about your future or stuff like that? Like, that's so narrow-minded. It's crazy. It really was. I mean, I have since gone to uni. I have... Bachelor of Science in Psychology. Yeah. Bachelor of Arts, double major, crim and sociology, and my honours in crim. So yeah, like I went on and did a lot of university but, study. But I guess I guess you gotta you gotta have to have the interest in it as well. You yeah. Know, it's not just about you know obviously you've you've got to be men, you know mentally gifted you know uh, but it's not just about that you've got to put in the work. It's the discipline behind it. I think. That's it. That's it. And like, I think people who actually do stuff on their own without the pressure of someone else or you know just pushing them to do stuff like you actually yeah have you a lot more dis- yeah you have a lot more discipline than uh, someone who's like gone to school and who's done like you know yeah being pressured and like you know all that sort of stuff um but um let's go back to a little bit to about like the aerobics uh coaching and stuff like that um i understand you actually had a pretty rough experience with a coach when you were doing this stuff right yeah <laughs> just <to> talk <laughs> a little bit about that um yeah, could you tell us a little bit about that, that experience, you know? and um... Sure. So, as I said, we did that first international competition and we came back and we wanted to up our game big time. So, we changed aerobics club. Um, when I say we, there at that time, there was four of us as things progressed, as we started to do better with our training. Uh, there was quite a few of us. We had quite a big international squad at the new club. And, yeah, so the 
it was sort of like a honeymoon phase when we started training at the new club and things were good for a while but then we very soon learnt that there were favourites and there were people that weren't favourites. Mm. Um, so there'd kind of usually be a favourite a month and this would rotate. They would rotate one favourite and they would also rotate one um, that was just getting nailed that month. Everything they did was wrong. Mm. That's pretty, I mean, like mentally, you know, to do that to kids to do that whole favorite thing like yeah so i was i was 12 when it started i was 15 when my parents removed me from the sport because of how severe it had gotten mm -hmm. so it was a steady process of they basically weeded people out i'm not sure if it was because they thought that they were trying to build us stronger mentally but the way they treated us was quite emotionally and mentally abusive and I don't say that lightly. I say that because that's what it was. Mm. And the experience that you've gone through, obviously. Yeah. So I, yeah, having the insight now, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Like I can look back on it and I can go, wow, that was, that was that, you know, that's the experience we went through as kids. And I mean, I could tell you countless stories about the treatment we went through. Um, the bullying that we experienced from our coach, how we were spoken to. I think for my last six months that I was at the club, I don't think there was a training where I didn't come home crying, thinking that I was worthless. And I was training very hard. I was very respectful to the coach. You know, they were the top coach. They were the New Zealand coach. Whatever they said was going to make me the world champion. And that's all that I wanted was just to be the world champion. But that was sort of like the number one goal. They were the yeah. number one coach. It was the number one goal. That's why we were training that much. That's why I homeschooled. I just wanted to train and get to the top. Uh, but they, I'm unsure if they thought that they were doing the best for us or if they were taking things out on us or if they just wanted their favorite to beat us. But mm. it was just constant mind games. It was uh, when we tried really hard, it would be you're not trying and you're lazy. And if we were injured, we were not spoken to and ignored, neglected until we trained through our injury. Like um, I remember having to sit outside the door crying with ice packs on me because I couldn't push through and train through my injuries. I remember... Um, one training before an international trip where I'd done an hour private lesson and then I ran out to go vomit in the toilet and then came back in for my next hour and a half training with my team and, you know, my team weren't speaking to me. And I was like, why? Why aren't you guys talking to me? Like I'm trying to whisper to them and try and find out what's happening. Yeah, and as a kid, that's pretty Yeah, hard. why, why yeah. aren't your friends talking mm. to you? Here I am, I think at this time, I think I was 15 when this one happened. Um, 15, my teammates 15 and I'm like, why are my friends like suddenly, you know, giving me the third degree? And it turns out my coach had told them not to talk to me because I was being an attention seeker and that not to give me any attention because that's all that I really wanted in that moment. And hey you, don't forget to subscribe, like and share this video. Yeah, so those were the games that the coach played it was man that's like mind games like mind, it was real mind like games really screwed up mind games at a young age as well yeah and it went on for i was there for three years uh i was one of the last ones to be there you know i was one of the first ones to join i was one of the last ones i think there might have been about four or three when i uh retired from the sport wow that were left when we had like an international squad of a good 11 athletes. And I can't speak on behalf of all them. I've talked to a couple in particular who have actually still been dealing with it. There's one who I, she's five years older than me and she was a senior athlete and she retired before we did and stepped out of the sport. But uh, she listened to a previous podcast I'd done with someone and talked about this and she had told me that 
you know what, we should have been there for each other. We should have talked about it. And she's still dealing with and processing what we went through as kids herself. Wow. So after all those years. After all these years, it's had such an ongoing effect. And that's just one of the ones I've talked to. And then I know others who are still dealing with injuries 10 years on because we were made to train through them as kids because we weren't good enough if we didn't train through them and just push through the pain to make our coach happy and show respect because we were disrespectful if we did anything wrong. Man, that's so screwed up. Yes. So screwed up. <laughs> but um, like, you know, how... How was it you um, managed to, like, I think what we can learn, like, what we can really learn from this is, like, how do we kind of realize the situation that's happening and how do we move away from it? Like, or if you could, if you would have done anything differently, you know. The difficulty was our coach didn't just speak poorly about us or to us. Uh, they quite often spoke down of other clubs and other gymnasts from other clubs mm. as well. So when we were competing, we didn't see there as any other option. We thought we were stuck. We thought that this was it. And if we didn't train at this club, we had to give up the sport and give up our dreams. So that's why so many of us pushed through for so long. Mm. But I think the thing is, if you're in that situation and you're experiencing that and you're unhappy competing the sport I mean this is the sad thing uh my favorite quotes when I was a kid was uh if you're going through hell keep going which is a quote by Winston Churchill <laughs> yeah speaking of war yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Muhammad Ali like you know hated every minute of training but you know it was yeah. like, oh my, well, that's like those should not be your like go-to quotes to get you through training yeah. as a teenager mm -hmm. Like if you're going through hell, keep going. It's it's not war. Yeah. Training should not be war. <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> um, so I like, mean, certain things you can apply it, but like not every day. Not every day. Mm -hmm. Not when you rock up to training, you're thinking like, okay, just get through this. And then if I get upset, I'll just hop in the car afterwards. There's a pillow there and I'll just scream into the pillow and that's how I'll survive it. I'll let out my emotions after training. That's how we thought of every single training session. Mm. And it was... Yeah, hard. looking back on it, I see how messed up that was, but that's just what we did to get through. And if people are in that situation now, I think people would be more aware of those situations with like documentaries like um, Athlete A, is it? Which is that gymnastics uh, one. Yeah. Oh, you have to give is it that a Is on watch. Netflix? Yes. Yeah, okay. I think it's Athlete A. Things like that make people more aware of what's happening and the practices that are happening within different sports. Because I know it's not just in gymnastics. Yeah. I know it's in mm -hmm. lots of different sports. Mm -hmm. But recognizing it, if you're always unhappy, there's an issue. And the thing that I've really learned is that there's always another way. There's always, always, always another way. There's always another pathway. There's never one way to the top. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had known that back then. Mm. yeah well i i mean the good thing about doing this and talking about it and sharing it so other people can uh, hopefully not make that same mistake you know yeah. and uh, realize or start to notice certain patterns and you know just make changes before yeah it gets like too bad you know um so like you know moving off there retiring from that and um talking about getting into like you're competing in bodybuilding and Fitness, is it fitness? Did I yes. get that right? Yeah. Fitness. Um, so how did, from, from that, how did you get into like... So I got pretty burned from my time in aerobics. Mm. As much as like when I was a kid, I had a massive passion for it. But after going through that, that mm. passion for competing in the sport dies, yeah. understandably. <laughs> so move away before your passion dies. Mm. Um, but I still really loved performance and moving. So... Mm. One thing I never stopped was, you know, I joined a gym at 16 as soon as I retired from competing. Our parents, like, because three of us retired at the same time and um, our parents literally drove us all down together to the local gym and said, well, you're stopping that, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> like, so they wouldn't let us just be inactive. Mm. Which but, is awesome. Yeah. Like, that uh, should be the way, you know. Our parents were honestly so great like that and a lot of people do ask us i just have to add this in a lot of people like well why would your parents leave you in a abusive situation like that for so long and 
the real reason is because I would not let them pull me out. Like mm. I would not let my parents stop me. And until it got to the point where they could see that it was affecting me on such a level in day-to-day life that they're like, nah. That's enough. That's enough. Mm. Yes. So, um, yeah, when it got to like safety levels, they pulled us. Mm-hmm. But I fought it. <laughs> I fought it a lot. <laughs> but yes, they took us down to the gym and uh, there was a massive aerobics room mm. at the gym, which was empty for like Les Mills classes and stuff. Mm. And we just used to train. We used to muck around and still do our skill and stretch. And we're like, we spent this many years mm. Doing learning this. all these things. Like you don't just want to lose it just because you stopped at that club. So yeah. we kept maintaining it. And then my mum became a personal trainer. Wow. Yeah, and so she started working at a local gym, and that gym had a lot of athletes that competed in uh, bodybuilding, and so she made heaps of friends. My mum, multi-talented woman she is, also was doing photography. Wow. <laughs> and so <laughs> she went to the comp and uh, was just taking photos, and she saw the fitness category at the competition, and she came back to me, and she's like, I think you should do it. Like, you love performing. You can still do everything you're in shape, go, just compete in fitness. Give and so try. I went to the next competition with her and watched it. And I was like, oh yeah, I think I can win this. <laughs> I'm not competitive that's at that all. That's <laughs> like, that, that's that championship mindset, eh? like tunnel vision. Yeah, you, like, you, don't win just, that <laughs> yeah, you don't just compete for fun. You compete mm. to win. <laughs> Which is, yeah, I think like, um, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Like when I, when I compete, like, uh, you know, I think I don't compete for fun. I want to yeah. win, you know. I train for fun. I enjoy mm. the training. That's the lifestyle factor I enjoy. I do enjoy being on stage, but I want to win. Yeah, you don't, you don't, I mean, you don't really go out there and want to like just. Well, it's not like you go and do a boxing match expecting to lose, right? You don't yeah. want to be hit in the face particularly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's right. It's true. But, <laughs> you know, you want to win, you know. Yeah. You know, put on performance and you want to win. Yeah. You know, that's how that's how it is, you know. Yeah. So on to that, like, um, you know, we were talking about this really funny is like, you know, you were saying about how, you know, you're competing and like, uh, you know, it's it's funny, but like you got to pay to compete. Yeah, <laughs> I got real fed up with it, honestly. <laughs> so like after that many years of aerobics and competing overseas and scrambling to pull together the funds to pay for it all. And then here I was in fitness doing the exact same thing that I'd been doing back then. So with fitness, I I did quite well in it. I did in my first year, I did maybe six competitions in my first year of competing. Wow. And I ended up winning one of the nationals that year and then the next year I oh I can't even remember it's honestly all of that's a blur so I did, <laughs> I did a bunch of competitions and then I started to compete internationally I did okay internationally on the first one and then I went into IFBB and did the Arnold Classic in Australia and I got third wow. over there and then I switched back because I prefer the natural competitions mm. <laughs> and so Ooh, when you say when you say natural like who are you talking about well, when I competed at the Arnold's, I just realized that the only way I would be able to win that competition mm. is with a lot of help. And I didn't want that help. <laughs> Which we're talking about. Okay, okay. And this is, oh, man, yo. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Slow down a little bit. Are we talking about, like, performance and enhancement drugs? Or yeah, like, what we're are talking about yo. performance enhancement drugs. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's pretty... Okay, so this is the thing, like... Um, it, it does exist, you know, it is there. Yeah. And like people, you know, obviously not everyone knows about it, but well, I do know about it. And like people who are in the industry, obviously, mm-hmm. and like they, at, at, I think at, at some points they were trying to make it seem like people were not on anything, which yeah. is stupid. <laughs> yeah, you know, like it's hard. You could you cannot not be on anything and be of like at that particular that, standard. Or, yeah, particularly like, I mean, the guys, you can't be that big. Without. Yeah, it's That's, insane. No way. Well, I think, well, um, one of the ones was like when I was listening to uh, Ronnie Coleman talk about it, like he's genetically gifted, so he didn't have to take a lot, but he was a different breed, you know what I mean? And most of the other guys, like they were on a whole lot of shit. They were like on a warehouse of supplies. Yeah. You know, just to get where they are. And it's so crazy. But would you say, do you think like it's, it's quite dangerous? Like 
to having been in that industry i've seen a lot and i've mm. heard a lot personally i've not experienced any of it which i'm mm. very happy about i've Luckily, never fooled yeah, around thankfully. with any of that stuff yeah but uh yeah I know that there's different cycles that you're meant to go through for some of them and some of them have longer lasting effects than other ones. Honestly, most of them require doctor or medical supervision mm -hmm. if you want to not have those side effects yeah. or to be able to recover from it on the other side. But I know for a fact that a lot of people don't. Yeah, they they want to take it, but they don't want to like follow through all the, you know, just the every little instruction yeah. or like things you need to take note of what you can not eat you know there's certain foods that you can't eat as well yeah um when you take certain performance enhancement drugs and stuff like that like i've seen i think uh, in my experience i actually seen a guy who took it and um, i don't know what happened but he just seemed to have got like a allergic reaction to it mm -hmm. and um his skin around his whole Red. body yeah just and like it wasn't just like the color that, that you know the discoloration but like he started to grow like lumps and like oh my was, god like, it was a horrible it looked like shit he, <laughs> yeah he just i don't know you don't want to mess with it because yeah he just you know he just started to look like a i wouldn't even say a snake like you know it was like man there was like stuff growing all over his chest and his arms and like it was it was just horrible to look at and like he what that's what sucks like he can't Can I, yeah you you, you can't you can't compete if you want like you know but yeah. it's there and it's gonna be there forever yeah. you know and like uh i think even like a couple of years later like it's still there like you still see it on his hands like, he still goes to the gym to train and all that mm -hmm. but you could still see it on his hands and I was the like, effect. Man. that's like you know you're permanently yeah so that's sort God. of the that's the situation i was at mm. i was uh i competed at the arnold classic my fitness routine because uh fitness the one that i was competing in it's not the fitness model category, it's fitness, full stop. And that means that, yes, you do a physique round, but there's a two-minute fitness routine that you compete as well, mm. where you do jumps, performance, whatever, whatever skills that you like, dance. And that's what appealed to me, is that side of things, because I couldn't go back to aerobics, so I wanted to do something on the stage. The performance side. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wanted the performance side and the standing on stage in the bikini was the less appealing side of things yeah. for me. But that's what but I, I think, ended up doing. I think when you are at a certain fitness level, like generally your body would look good anyway, you know, like. Yeah, so we still dieted and mm -hmm. did all that sort of stuff. And my fitness routine at the Arnold's won. So I won the routine category. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the physique category, I was way down the line, which bumped me to third place. And that's just, I could not compete with those women. I was young when I competed. I was 22 or 23 when I did the Arnold's. Mm. And so I didn't have the muscle mass. I was not as lean and I did not have any implants. Mm. So yeah. those were all sort of factors. And when I came back, they're like, yeah, you should really take a year off to grow. And then it was just sort of like, grow you know what we mean by that and i was yeah. just like yeah nah that's not i'll my go thing. back to the natural comps mm. and and just enjoy being on stage and what i look like is what i look like because i'm a gymnast you know my body looks the way it does because it does the things it does mm -hmm. not just because i make it to look a certain way like it's functional yeah, yeah it's very i think that was those ones are very engineered you yeah know? So like, yeah, man, that's, well, it's pretty crazy, you know, and there's, there's a lot of pressure in that as well. Like, you know, they, well, thankfully you didn't fall into that pressure. I can understand how a lot of people would though, because it seems like mm. once you're in that world, you know, that world is also, a world, it's its own bubble. Yeah, that and circle, so the it circle can of be, people as well. Yep. Yeah, it can really be everything to the people who are in mm -hmm. it. And I'm glad that it wasn't everything to me. Thankfully, glad yeah. I didn't sell my soul to that. So from from there, like, how did you get into stunts? Like, how was it? How how did you yeah. stumble across it? Or so I was competing in fitness, and after all that experience, I switched back to the natural competitions, and um, 
I was training to compete. I did really well at one natural event called uh, Muscle Mania. Mm. And I competed over there and I entered like bikini for fun and I came like fourth in the bikini class and then I Muscle Mania, where, where's that one held? That's in Vegas. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So that's quite a big competition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a very big competition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, when you said when you said Muscle Mania, I was like, man, that, that sounds like a pretty big competition. I was like, oh. Yeah, yeah. So I came fourth. That's in not the... like a local show. <laughs> <laughs> not <Okay>. at all. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately like most of the big natural ones are all overseas. Yeah. 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 So you gotta travel for them. And mm-hmm. so I got fourth over there and then second in the fitness. So I was like Oh, I was so close to like winning and getting that pro card. And so like that became my goal then to like win the fitness. But in the meantime, I'd spent so much money going overseas to mm. compete. And it just seemed like it was just draining me. And I'm like, surely with my skill set and with all the money and time I've invested into my skills, I can get some kind of return for this. So originally I went to an agency to do fitness modeling because I'm like, sports model, commercial stuff, surely Mm. commercial fitness modeling will pay. And then I brought in my CV and everything I'd done and they sort of looked at it and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we like also do some like extras work as well. Would you be interested in that? And I'm like, oh, I'd never thought about extra stuff. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I'll be happy if you put me forward for that. Why not? And then they're like, oh, actually, like looking at the gymnastics, they're like, you might be good for stunts. And I'm like, what stunts? <laughs> like, what was this? Is this a thing? Like, you know, like doing cool stuff and they're like, yeah, we'll put you in touch. And they actually told me to go to the New Zealand stunt school, which mm. is where I met Dana Grant. And yeah, then I injured my ankle real bad. <laughs> and I was out yeah. for like six months. From doing stunt training? No, just from my usual training that I do. Just the gymnastics that I'd muck around oh, doing. My. At yep. trying to up my skills for my fitness routine mm-hmm. i managed to injure myself pretty bad that was fun that was an ambulance <laughs> oh shit oh. but um yeah it put definitely put you uh, how long were you out for like uh when the injury happened like four or five months round about yeah mm. i'm trying to remember that one there's been two other <laughs> two other ones since then oh shoot <laughs> i mean like competing, I mean, doing, not competing, but like doing stuff like this, there's bound to be... There's so many injuries yeah, all the yeah. time. Like I've never met a stunt performer that mm. has ever been 100%. I've, well, to be fair, I've never met an athlete that's ever operated at 100%. Mm. Like when I was competing at my peak, I still had something that was an issue or a niggle or something. Mm. I was never competing. Um, My last time competing... At the International Aerobic Championships, I had sesamoiditis, which was like inflammation through my foot. So every time I jumped was just like agony through the Ooh. through the foot. Yeah. And yet we came home with a medal. Like, so I could only think about the people who won gold. They were probably just as injured. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's, there's always. There's always. Yeah, something. There's always something. Right. But um, so you know when you started like training, doing stunts, um, you know training at that stunt school and all that. And um, at that time, were there a lot of like stunt work here in New Zealand or? I was kind of unaware of it. I'd heard of a few jobs, but Mm. the way I thought of stunts was when I first started, I was like, hey, this is fun. This is a new skill. This is sort of a new sport. I didn't think of it as a career because I was studying at university at the time. Mm. And my goal was criminal rehabilitation. That's what I wanted to work in. I was really interested in prisons and I wanted to go and work in prisons all the time. That was what I was planning to do and then sort of like um yeah helping people yeah really Mm. helping people and if it was either in prisons or doing policy work to change the way prisons operated and actually stopping recidivism yeah Mm, yeah trying to break the cycle sort of thing that was really what I wanted to do and then I got into stunts (laughs) and I was just training just for fun I the way I thought of it was a sport that had a return. So, you know, I can spend all this money on training, but then if I work one day, that'll pay for all that training. Mm. If I work two days, then it pays for that training and a little bit more. That's just the way I thought of it is a sport that would pay for itself. Whereas the sports I was competing in were just draining me and I was having to scramble for money to pay for them. And then I worked my first job in stunts. And after that, there was nothing else for me. (laughs) I was, my first job was on Ash vs. Evil Dead, 
season two and I came in and I was studying my honours degree at the time and so I was just bouncing between that and my honours degree and fortunately I had very understanding lecturers because they're like yeah just go don't worry about don't worry about the tutorial just yeah. go work in the film set <laughs> <I was> like, <"Yes." laughs> but it was it was amazing mm. and very much found my passion when I started working in there what what are the what are like the stuff that you do like tell us a little bit about like like the particular stunt work that you do so on that job when i started i was mostly wire work so that's when you're in a harness okay. there's a wire attached to you mm -hmm. and there's three people on the end of the line and there's one person going three two one and then you go flying through the air oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you hit the ground or the wall oh shit either one quite yeah. hard but there's mats <laughs> is there is there not mats when you rehearse there's mats oh <laughs> and then um, just hopefully your costume's really nice with you, know, you can fit some padding and stuff in. oh my so there's not okay wait, so there's not always meds like there's no green screen there's no like uh, so they actually make you hit it, the wall it depends on the budget oh <laughs> <laughs> like oh, do you know how much post-production costs yeah well i understand you know <laughs> it takes time and uh, it, it, yeah time it, equals money so yeah green screen elements are expensive it is so it, is. it depends on the budget uh oh my. but for low budget tv shows you're gonna hit the ground hard ouch <laughs> you just hope that uh you're prepared for impact yeah and oh, you gotta shit. hope that the other departments are on your side as well you gotta hope that costume has given you a costume which like is like full length sleeve so you can fit on like elbow pads and you hope that it's like pants and things so you can fit a back pad and all the padding in mm. like underneath everything you've got to hope that art department has created a soft floor if you're real lucky which is like a fake floor they can yeah. just pull out and you got something yeah, to land on yeah that. the more padding you can get the better but yeah it's a team effort yeah so uh, okay other than the wire work what other stuff we're talking about so the things that I've mostly done on film, the things that I mostly get paid for is fighting and wires and falling over. So much just like, we just need someone to hit the deck. <laughs> just on cue. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so that's mostly what we do. But I've also um, had some experience like with fire burns, had some experience around horses, like horse drags and horse falls and things. Horse drags. So when the horse is and you're getting dragged by it. Like actually. Like actually being dragged by a horse. They're trained horses. They're trained for stunts. They're very impressive. But still. <laughs> you're getting dragged by a getting horse. Getting dragged by a horse. Yeah. Oh shit. Man, that's wild. It's quite fun. Man, it's gonna <laughs> it's be quite fun. It's gonna be like some money behind it for you to get dragged by a horse. I that was free. Yeah, don't. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have said that one. Oh, my. You've got to do a lot of things to, like, get the experience. You've got to do a lot of, you know, you don't always get paid to start with. So, like, I'm not going to get paid to fight on camera unless I've fought 20 times before and gotten my skills good enough to be paid on camera, you know? So. But, man, getting dragged... Getting dragged by a horse for free, that's like a whole nother level. <laughs> Shit. Hey you, don't forget to subscribe, like and share this video. Um, I understand you do a bit of jiu-jitsu yourself and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but like when you say fighting, um, you've never... How did you get into fighting? Like, uh... Yeah, I've never had a fight yeah. before. I never started in martial arts. Mm. So when I started at the stunt school and they were trying to teach me how to fight for camera, I was the most awkward person you'd ever met. You know, like when I tried to throw a punch, I didn't put my shoulders into it. I like one arm would be down here when I'd punch, you know, like <laughs> it was just horrific. I'd never, like I'd never even done box fit or anything like that. Yeah. And so I had zero clue. So I had a lot of catch up to do mm. to say the least. Um, Oh my gosh, I just, like, I cringed to think how bad it was. I was so bad. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> it, was, it was embarrassing. But because of that, I did a lot of fighting for film. And then mm -hmm. I had to start martial arts. Mm. Because you can't pretend to throw a punch well unless you know how to throw a punch mm -hmm. well in the Definitely, first place. Yeah. So obviously in film, 
for the most part, you're not making contact. I say for the most part because like on some kicks, on some punches, you do actually connect, but you don't fully connect. You've got to have the control to pull it back and not actually mm. smash up your partner because it's a dance. Mm, yes. Like stunt fighting is very much a dance and you're working with them and you've got to be prepared to do that 20 takes over, you know? So if you're actually yeah. like socking them each time, yeah. Yeah, it's they're not, not going to want to work with your cam. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, you're and be they're absorbing. Yeah. yeah, absorbing the whole thing. You know, yeah. like that's not good at all. Yeah, and then the other thing is a lot of uh, a lot of martial arts doesn't actually translate well to camera. Mm. Uh, so jujitsu is one that does. So you would have seen that. I mean, like the John Wick movies and all that sort of mm. stuff. Like you know, you see the jujitsu and some of the judo throws in there, and they look amazing. But in some things like um, Muay Thai has some techniques which work like elbows and things, but when you're up really tight and close to someone, they can't see it. When you're on yeah. camera, you can't see that. You, you need the, that. Yeah, you need the distance. You need to be able to tell the story through the movement as well. Kickboxing would be a better compared yeah, to Muay Kickboxing's time. great. Taekwondo. There's a lot of um, Taekwondo world mm. champions. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> that have gone into stunts. Mm. So um, that's not to say that you can't do those martial arts and do really well because mm -hmm. a lot do. One that's really good is Wushu. I started in Wushu, which is... Yeah, that's pretty cool. I yeah. saw your uh, your Instagram, you did the Wushu. How, how did you yeah. get to that? Um, again, I was suggested it by Stunties. <laughs> so yeah. they said that you need to work on your weapons work. And so mm. I went, okay, how do I work on weapons? And they're like, well, Wushu, it's Kung Fu with weapons. So you're working with broadsword, straight sword, um, staff spear all mm. those sorts of things so now if you chuck me any of those weapons i at least know how to basically use them yeah like but it's free <laughs> <laughs> so we should not uh, really if you get into a fight with anybody like they got to make sure that there's nothing that you can pick up and nothing and, uh... that i can pick up <laughs> <laughs> but no I'm, i'd probably be terrible in a fight though mm. because knowing me and knowing stunts i'd probably stop it just shy just of the before. person <laughs> <laughs> like and all the energy stops uh no impact mm. yeah <laughs> so, oh that's really cool that's so really cool yeah. I mean, there's so much to film fighting and I'm far from an expert. I'm far. I've been doing stunts now, not even five years. And the amount that I've learned from where I've gone, mm. I've, I've traveled overseas as well. So that's why I have so many friends in the States because mm. you spent a fair bit of time over there. I've spent a lot of time. So I did five competitions there as an aerobics athlete where I competed I think I did three or four as the New Zealand coach taking athletes there. Mm -hmm. And then I did the two muscle mania competitions competing there myself. So that's 11 competitions I've done there. And oh. then on top of that, I spent quite some time there. Um, I basically lived there for five mm -hmm. weeks in LA. And then every time I go back, I always spend extra time going around visiting mm -hmm. people. Yeah, and I just, when you're there, yeah, you want to waste a trip. I just know? take it as a learning opportunity. And so some of the friends that I made at those fitness competitions, we used to get together and literally just go around and do as many fitness classes as we possibly could. So that's how I met a lot of the stunt performers is I went to a couple of parkour gyms and did some parkour classes. Mm. And then I met, I met the pro parkour athletes over there. Then I met the stunt guys who took me to the next training where I met wow. the next people who took me to the next training and then just networking and meeting people and training. Mm. So the amount that I've learned in the last five years is exponential mm. compared to where I was. But. So obviously, you know, with doing a lot of traveling, um, you always have a lot of funny stories from traveling. Of all your travels, you know, like uh, during this whole time, like, you know, competing and like learning and working and all that, what was, what was like one of the funny yeah, experiences that you've had? Oh, funny or sad? <laughs> oh, whichever interest, you know, it could be either way, I don't know. Oh, like, I mean, the trip that I did to Vegas for the competition. Oh, Vegas. <laughs> yeah, Vegas. It's yeah. a great start. Okay. No, so we were, I went from Vegas and then I was going to Rhode Island to visit my friend and then I was going to New York to visit another friend and mm. then San Fran and then back to LA and home. In that time, they lost my luggage three times <laughs> through the flights. <laughs> Just no clue where it was. Wasn't turning up for days at oh, a time. Oh, that's terrible. So I was just having to buy stuff again. I mean, with the trip that I did, the five-week trip I did, um, 
as I said, I went there as a learning experience. There wasn't much work here for stunts. Mm -hmm. So I really took the opportunity. I'm like, well, if there's no one here, because they've all gone overseas for work, there's no work here. There's no one to learn from here. So I'm going to go make my opportunities. Mm. So go to do where the... Yeah, go, go where things are happening. There'll at least be people training there. And so my friend and I went and we were training probably six hours a day most days and just trying to like retain everything. And then... Stunts is very male dominated. There's not yeah. that many women. <laughs> I think we were talking about that earlier as well. It's, it's, it's really male dominated. Mm. And so the issue with that is that sometimes I forget that I'm a woman. And not to be sexist at mm. all, mm. but women are not as strong as guys. They're not as fast. Like, you know, there's just that general capacity mm. where we limit. Um, and so we were training and I was trying a new trick. And I thought I could keep up with the guys. This is on like hour five of training. And I'm like, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. Yeah, I busted my ankle real mm. bad. And I came home yeah. in a wheelchair. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty rough. <laughs> so that's okay. pretty rough. Fortunately, oh, yeah. it was like the last three days of the trip. Oh. Yeah. So yeah. I'd done all those weeks and all that mm. training. And then it was right at the end. I mean, on the third day, I dislocated my finger. Oh, but you just it's fine. oh man just put it back together <laughs> oh, you got another month to last oh man but, that's rough yeah that, but um yeah that's what we, the other th one of the other things we're talking about like you know in in that kind of industry injuries are pretty common you know and well i don't want to say work through the injury but like if you stop you don't get paid yeah yeah so for the most part, most of my injuries have been ones that I've done to myself through mm. pushing too hard through training. Um, just that when that fatigue kicks in. Yeah, and, and not knowing when to stop. That's really my issue is that I just seem to think that I'm invincible and just can keep going. I'm not very good at listening <laughs> to my body sometimes. <laughs> I, just, I just like to train and so I just want to keep training. And so if it's a two-hour training, I want to train the whole time. Mm. So that's why training with a coach is also really good because it's like, stop now. <laughs> like yeah. I can see what's happening. Yeah, someone can kind of stop. <laughs> someone can kind of see when you reach that point where. The, yeah, you're you going to stop benefiting from mm. the training session, and I think that's actually really crucial for anyone in any sport to recognize. Is like, when you do you hit the wall in a training mentally, or have you hit the wall in training physically? Mm -hmm. And if you've hit the wall in training physically, you need to slow down and recognize that because you still want to be able to train the next day and get mm -hmm. the most out of your body physically the next day. Whereas if you ignore it, you're going to burn out and you're going to stuff up the next training. And, mm. you know, that's how burnout starts. Yeah, and definitely with with time as well, I mean, like with advancements in technology and all that, there's so many tools now that they have. Like, you know, they have the sleep ring. They yeah. have the, uh, the one of the other, uh, recent ones that I just got to know about was the whoop strap where... Uh, have you heard of the whoop no, strap? I haven't before? heard about the whoop strap. So yeah, a mate of mine actually. He uh, oh, actually Cameron Ralston was a, one of the guys that we did the uh, podcast with, and yep. he was telling me about the whoop strap, which was pretty cool. So it's basically a strap that you wear during a workout or trainings, and it will kind of gauge like uh, what kind of strain it's putting on your body, uh, what's the benefit you're getting out of it, and yep. so on and so forth. And like, um, it's uh, it will just measure like your progress, you know, because mm. you do all that, and it will kind of tell you when is the time for you to like pull back, relax. When is, time, when is the time to go hard, what you want to achieve and all that sort of stuff. And what's interesting is the way that they kind of charge, man, this is not an ad, it's not sponsored or anything like that, but uh, um, they, it, it's, it's sort of like a membership kind of thing. So it's not yeah. like a one-time product which you buy and use, which I use the, like the Polar um, straps, the heart rate monitors, right? So I yeah. use the straps. So it's just like a one-time thing. You pay, you use it and you do whatever you want with it, you know, but like for the wood straps, it's like a membership thing. So it's really smart because they're constantly taking your money. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so they take a money from it's you. They, you know, they, they take like yeah. a fixed amount of money from you every month and you yeah. you keep paying, but they they offer all the services as upgrades and new stuff. But mm. like they're kind of building like a community. But uh, I think like, you know, like on that topic, like, you know, just how all these tools that are there now to kind of help you to better navigate through this sort of stuff, you yeah. know. Uh, like back then we didn't have all this you know like I it was so hard pushed. like yeah you just push like what you said you know and just kept training and push and like you don't complain and if you want to get better you want to probably like that was what was told to us you know? yeah like, 
work hard and like you know push through the level of discomfort yeah i think it kind of slowly um uh, along with times like yeah. you know you slowly learn but you got to work smart as well yeah so all these little things come into it but um yeah uh, the other thing i want to ask like you know you're saying how you kind of went overseas to pursue stunts and all that to do stunts um and you've worked on quite a few um for those who are interested to see the full list of what, <laughs> where you worked on for your stunts and all that, um, you can actually find it. Um, I'll, I'll put I'll put a link to that maybe. Um, but yeah, one of the ones that you did was on Avatar. Um, what did you, what did you do there? Like that's so cool. Yeah, so that's the new one. So I can't. Do no, no. That. Um, the the one that you did before that was not. Was it, uh, Oh, it is. Oh, <laughs> yeah, my bad. Yeah, sorry, sorry, it's not supposed to come out yet. But, um, okay, so maybe I would say like uh, of all the stunts that you've done, like for the particular sets, which has been like the coolest one? Or so for me, there's lots of different. Oh, there's different degrees of stunts. What I find really cool uh, may not seem so impressive to other people. Mm. So the big stunts aren't, aren't necessarily like most fun or the coolest it really is the people that you get to work with in the environment you're in i'm trying to think about the ones on film that i've really like really loved um a lot of them are ones that i'm working on at the moment Ooh. and it's so hard to not talk about them okay don't don't say the name just say what you did like would that be you know uh, uh, <laughs> i'm trying to think okay uh what's been released okay uh one job that I very briefly worked on and did a little bit of work on, which was an awesome stunt that is released, but I don't know if it's in New Zealand or not. Mm. Uh, it's a movie called Fantasy Island. It was Ooh. a Netflix Special. Movie. Oh, okay. Um, um, I might not be in this region. Yeah, I, I think it might just mm. be in America. Mm -hmm. uh, but I worked on that and it was the coolest stunt because it was a zip line Ooh. into a yep. pool. A zip line into a pool? And I was flown to Fiji. To zip line into a pool. Wow. That's <laughs> so, so like, cool. so one thing about stunts is that there are hard days and there are easy days. Mm. And really, the thing is, your pay rate stays the same through all of it. But really? Yeah. So, wait, part, okay. like, you can, there, there are adjustments and bonuses depending on like really, really dangerous things. Mm. But, you know, if you're working full time on a job or if you're working a lot, you know, there's going to be days where you're, fighting non-stop there's going to mm. be days where you're waiting around to perform and all you do is fall over once and then you know those days are paid the same okay i, I want to get a little bit into this because like this is something that people don't you know generally don't know about i don't know about so i want to ask like yeah. a, a lot of questions <laughs> but one question i have is like who sets this amount like do you set your own amount or is it like given by the producers directors or the production company or like, how does it work this is a very controversial topic within mm. stunts being a new person i can't speak about it too much mm -hmm. but for the mm -hmm. most part we like to get into controversy that's the whole yeah. point of this podcast. <laughs> a lot of no i'm just joking yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. so in new zealand we have um the stunt guild but we're a guild we are not uh um we're not a union so we can't you know i don't know if mm. anyone's been following like the hobbit law and things but there's certain we can't barter Oh, I'm not going to explain this well at all. Yeah, we're going to butcher it, but it's yeah, all right. It's, we can butcher it. But basically, we butcher, we're, we're contractors, <laughs> so we can always go in and bat for ourselves and say, we want this. But for the most part, there's a budget which is set by production. Um, the coordinators who are hired, well, performers are only allowed to work for coordinators. The coordinators who are hired are assigned, you know, their budget, budget. Mm -hmm. for the production, and they need to figure out that and quite often you know it's up to the coordinators to talk mm. with the production about well i want to give my performers this rate because it's what they deserve and you know it's the whole thing of productions tend to budget a couple of years in advance before they come to new zealand and the issue with getting pay rises and things is they budget on old rates and then not many people get pay rises and it's mm. so it's that whole issue that yeah so for the most part productions decide and they go on old rates and things and coordinators are the ones that really negotiate on behalf of the performers. Even though we're all contractors, we can all like personally, I could go to a coordinator, I could go to production with an issue with my contract. Um, but it's not very common. Cause mm. Generally, I think that's one of the other things Like, generally people don't really like, um, 
I don't know how to say it, but like you know, it's it's hard sometimes when like you're in a group and you you know you don't want to like push too much or push too far because yeah. like everybody else is gonna be like your mates. I you know they they are your mates who are working with you and stuff like that. And you know some people might be like, oh, we're not asking like you know why you uh you know. Yeah, I think that's generally the fear like with rates and pay mm. and all that sort of stuff. It's because it's freelance, because it's contract. It's like well if you try and better the deal and you know mm. you want more and more and more then i think it's the fear of losing the job yeah but, but i think that also brings the whole industry back as a whole because if everyone's gonna like keep undercutting yeah because that's the thing like hey, man I, 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 it sucks because businesses like they drive you know mm. when people freelance contractors especially you know and for me being um i actually spent a fair bit of my life being a freelance contractor so i ex exactly understand what you're talking about and it sucks because everybody's undercutting everybody yeah and the companies will come to us and they'll say look man uh, we're gonna offer you this and uh, this is the price we're gonna give you like yeah. you know uh if you don't want to take it this guy has you know and they'll say oh this guy has you know uh, taken, this, you know, yeah. taken it at this price or we're going to offer it to this person, you know? So like, they like to use that kind of stuff, you know, but it sucks yeah. because people need to, I think, you know, one good thing about like talking about having a union, one good thing about having a union is they kind of work collectively yeah, to so negotiate. Overseas, like in America, they have a union, mm -hmm. um, sag -Aftra, and that's for like, that's for voiceover artists. That's mm. for, um, Sing, I think singers, actors, all those sorts of things. So it's kind of like a creative union in the whole and they have pay scales mm -hmm. and it's kind of like expected pay rises and things all sort of in that. So people know from the outset that if you hire someone from this, you're expected to pay this or it's not going to be affiliated with us. Um, I don't know too much about that because mm -hmm. I'm not yeah. in that mm -hmm. union. I'm not. But do you think like, um, okay, put it this way, like for the work that you do, do you think you are well compensated for it? Personally, mm. I do. But also, mm. I'm someone that is new to the industry mm. that doesn't have any dependents, you know? Yeah. So, if, I don't know, if you ask a coordinator that's been in it for 20 years who's got a couple of kids and a family, ask them and see what they say. And also, they've got the experience and they've had people, you know, they've worked all around the world, so they'll have a much better idea of the we're getting fairly compensated here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would like to get uh, someone of that um, background and talk to them and ask them about yeah. it. It's really cool, you know, when you learn about this sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, the the strange one, uh, the other strange thing that you mentioned is like, it's actually get, getting quite busy here in New Zealand in the whole film scene, stunt scene and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, why was that? Like, I think at the moment it's very appealing to film in New Zealand, obviously because of COVID. Mm. So because of the pandemic, we are a very safe country and we have good practices. And so a lot of countries are quite keen to film their productions here, but also New Zealand is cheap. Our dollar is not fantastic compared to a lot of other countries. Mm -hmm. true, true. And so on top of... Well, compared to the US dollar and the pound. Which, yeah. You know. So yeah. basically if... <laughs> yeah. If we have, uh, yeah, our dollar's not as good and our rates are lower as well on top of that, then mm. it becomes quite affordable to film here, plus safer. Because, I mean, if a production overseas gets shut down because of COVID, that costs millions. Mm. It costs millions to try and... Just to shut everything down, put it away, and then come, come back, back again. It, or Ooh. do you just shut it down? Yeah. And then the loss from shutting it down. So, yeah, it's... It's become quite appealing here. Mm, definitely, yeah. yeah. I think it will make sense. And, well, that's good for the people who who are already doing it here. Uh, one of the ones that, um, one of the questions that I want to ask is, like, what would be your, what's, like, your advice for someone who, you know, having, like, gone through this, you know, being this for, like, close to five years, you'd say? Yeah. What is your advice for someone who, like, wants to get into this stuff, like, who wants to get into stunts and all that? What would you recommend or advise them to do? Mm. Yeah, I'm holding my tongue because my immediate response is don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
Honestly, I love stunts to bits. It's mm. really my dream career, and I'm really very passionate about it. But you have to be, because I don't think I would have been in it for or five years and been pursuing it as a career if I wasn't this passionate, because it is quite, um, it can be quite draining. Because there's there's so many aspects of the industry we haven't talked about. For, for starters, the freelance stuff, you know, it's feast or famine. So you need to know how to budget and you need to know how to finance things. You need possibly a backup option. You need to be okay with taking like part-time jobs and working random jobs, but somehow still being able to train and still being able to upskill specific to the stunt industry. Then there's other things. I think I actually got into it at the right time. So for me, I was, once I started in stunts, I was always like, damn, I wish I known about this earlier. I wish like when I was 18, I discovered that like stuff uni, I could have gone straight into this. But I don't think mentally I would have been able to withstand it because there's other issues to do with casting. So particularly as a woman, there's been multiple times when they're like, hey, you're the right height, but you're actually just a bit too big for us. You know, or mm. hi, you're the right height and you're actually the biggest person we can find and we still need to put a fat suit on you to match the actress. So mm. there's things like that. So it really messes with body image or they need to change your hair. There's been multiple times where, oh my gosh, Ash vs. Evil Dead season three. I think I must have had four or five haircuts on mm. that job. I just remember like standing there on set, focusing on the job. And then I look over and I see the <laughs> hair and makeup. And they're just standing there talking to each other and looking at me. And I'm like, oh, no, here oh, we go. And yeah. I'm, like, I'm trying to work. And then I'm like, uh, sure enough, they walk over and they're like, your hair's too long now. We just need to cut it again. <laughs> they get out the tape measure. It's got to make sure it's 23 inches from the front to the back perfectly. And just like, just right there on set, just chop it. Oh, so wow. like, you can't be attached to your looks looks yeah wow. and it has to you have to be okay with changing mm -hmm. it's very rare that they'll ask you to put on weight but i know people that have been asked to lose weight or oh, for guys i know guys that have had to bulk up yeah and so then you've got the issue of possibly having to take some things yeah. to mean, help for a cycle <laughs> yeah, so, like you can't naturally just like put on size suddenly yeah, yeah. That, or that much yeah like. and so yeah or be on strict diets I wasn't around when uh, the show Spartacus was on, but I've worked with a lot of people <laughs> that worked on that show. And I just heard about how there was like a table for like, cause you get fed, there's catering, mm. there's like crew has one side of catering. And then there's like the chicken and broccoli for the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, Oh, you poor people that you had to suffer through that job. Oh like, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. But so, yeah. At 18, 19 years old, I don't think I personally, after my aerobics experience, I don't think I personally would have been mentally strong enough to withstand this industry. Mm. Being older now, I I can take it on the chin. I'm like, yeah, it is what it is. Like, I'm not the right height. I'm not the right color. I'm not the right ethnicity or the size. Or um, I've even lost jobs for really weird things. Like, hey, you. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this video. jobs for really weird things like oh, yeah um random measurements like arm measurements and things like they need and it just they need this particular body so shape just for wasn't actually your fault like no there's nothing you can do hmm. you could be the most talented performer in the world but you still won't get cast for that job because you're just not the right look which can also be very frustrating hmm. and um yeah it gets, uh, it kind of gets to your head, like. It can get to your head a lot, mm. particularly if you work hard and you train all the time. You're like, I deserve it, but there's just no job for you. And so I think getting into the industry, as long as your eyes are open and, you know, you're not looking through rose-tinted glasses thinking, oh, movies, I'm going to be a movie star. You're not. Mm. <laughs> like, Because quite frankly, no one knows. No one knows who stunt performers are. That's the other thing. Yeah, it's that's like, a sad part of it. If you could it, list you know? five stunt performers for me right now, like, I know. Well, you number, number one's you and second Sam Hargrave. Like, this is the two Cool, names. so that's two. Can you name <laughs> any more? No. You got three to go. No. <laughs> See, that's Yo, what I mean. Like, yeah. you think about all those action movies you watch. Mm. All those Marvel movies, every single lead actor there, every single Marvel hero would have a stunt double mm. doing most of that work. Can you name them? 
Oh, well, I actually know the the one who does for the rock. Yeah, that, that might have been the other guy. I can't remember his name, but I know who he, I, I've seen him. But that's because the rock it's gives him cousin. recognition. Yeah, you know, he gives it's him recognition. It's the rock's recon- cousin. Yeah, you see, like, <laughs> if he didn't, if he didn't, you wouldn't hear of him. Yeah. But that's the thing about stunts is you don't do stunts for the glory. Mm, true. Yeah. I think one of the one of the roughest ones I think um, that I kind of remember was uh, Home Alone. Yeah. That was like when we were kids, you know, and you watch Home Alone and those two jokers who always like, you know, they always get smashed everywhere yeah. and shit like that. And I looked at that and it's like, man, at the back of my mind, like that guy has got to earn a lot of money to be able to like take all that take all the hits oh shit but it wouldn't be the actor it would be his double yeah and I was like man that's pretty crazy but yeah talking about that is that do you reckon that's like an issue like you know oh I feel 100% like Mm. there's like a bit of a movement in stunts um like there's people that are trying to fight for Oscars for stunts and things like that because there's not Mm. many is there not like awards for stunts and stuff like that there are stunt specific award shows Mm. so I know of the Taurus Awards and the Artemis Awards which are for stunt people, but mm. people in the mainstream media don't know about it. And or they don't want to um, yeah. publicize. At, or, or I don't know. That could possibly be the reason because a lot of actors and actresses, like a lot of them are really supportive and support stunts. Some of them want to say they do their own. And then there's some things that are maybe saying that stunt performers do a lot of the work and that stunt performers get face replaced sometimes takes away from the movie itself or the production itself so it Mm. takes some of that magic away so they don't want to take the magic away Mm. um who knows i mean there's lots of ways you could think about it but i definitely think because i know some amazing amazing performers i've met some people that have just done the most incredible things risked their lives for Mm. films and they don't get much recognition and i i definitely think they deserve it Mm, there should be there should be something that uh, can be done in that uh (laughs) that particular area Man, um, some of the things you say, like I, w- I wish I could say more. <laughs> yeah, a lot. I, I, yeah, there's there's certain things, certain industries, like you can't really. Say I can say much. it in like five years time. In five years time, come back to me when everything's been released <laughs> from this year. And I can say it all. <laughs> but yeah, um, so how uh, back to the progression? Like, what is the kind of steps they should take? Uh, so the best way mm. is to know someone who's in the industry, which mm-hmm. is obviously the hardest way. But mm. um, I was fortunate in that I met Dana Grant through the stunt school. Um, she introduced me to someone who introduced me to someone who introduced me to someone. Mm. And so it's like a web. It is absolutely a web. And then it's also being able to back up mm. what you put out. So if I had gone on to that first job, and being terrible, I likely would have never worked again. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just very fortunate that I got the right opportunity at the right time, that I had the right skill set for. Uh, and they gave me a shot because I had only been training for six months when I got my first big job. Mm. And it had some big mainline stunts in it that um, performers nowadays wouldn't have been given to do had they been starting. I think the best place to start, though, is actually... For New Zealanders, Mm -hmm. it's to go to the Stunt Guild because there's a whole grading procedure to get in as a registered performer. And uh, stunt coordinators in New Zealand go to the Guild first. Okay. Yeah, Mm. so they look to the Stunt Guild first to people who are qualified. um, And then if they can't find anyone on there, then they ask the qualified performers, who do you know that fits this bill? Mm. Okay. And that's then how they go reach out and pull people in. And look for those who they want with particular skill sets and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's... they'll quite often, like, if a stunt coordinator is looking for a specialist, uh, they'll go to that. Mm. They'll go to that school. They'll go to that specialist. Like, if they're looking for a martial arts specialist, mm-hmm. they'll go to who they know in that industry and find someone. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, so uh, what are your you know, your future plans, like, from here on out? So, uh, very hard to tell. Mm. <laughs> With COVID and the way mm. the world is working right now, it's, you know, you can make plans. The chances of them happening are pretty yeah. slim to none. Mm-hmm. So, at the moment, it's just training. I'm actually finishing my personal training certification. Wow. It'll be done very soon. Awesome. I've actually, I did that to start with four stunts. 
because I'd like to um, do actor training. Because, okay. you know, in action movies and things like that, quite often the training of the actor gets left with the stunt department. Mm. And being a coach already, I was like, well, that's also in my skill set. So finished personal training certificate and go wow, for that. Awesome. And also I've had a lot of people from doing martial arts like jujitsu and wushu and stuff. People are like, you're so flexible. I want to be flexible like you. And also in jujitsu, you're a pain in the ass if you're flexible because your legs are everywhere. Yeah. Your legs <laughs> <laughs> um, and to me, that was always just normal because that's, mm. well, I couldn't do it as a kid, but I fought really hard for it and I trained it and I maintained it. And um, I didn't realize how abnormal it actually was until I started to train martial arts. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I can actually also help people in this regard. So I'm really wanting to uh, branch out in that more and help people with their flexibility on a wider scale outside of stunts. That's my side passion project to help people. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really awesome because like, yeah, a lot of people are just really stiff, you know, like <laughs> if people don't get into aerobics and gymnastics <laughs> from a young age, like, like me, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm like quite stiff, you know, and like one of the funny ones, like, you know, when I tried to go and do yoga, I was like, everybody's like, do, you know, easily doing everything. And I was like, oh. Like and just like, trying to like you know, grab a leg and like force yeah, it I into just, place. I just felt like my body was breaking. I was like, <laughs> what? And you know, you look at all, I look left and right and you know, everybody's like cruising through the whole session. Yeah. And I was like, man, I'm sweating and I'm like, I feel pains everywhere. I was like, what yeah. is going on? <laughs> it's like that. And I, I didn't realize that's how most people felt mm. until I just actually started to train with as weird as it sounds, until I start to train with adults. Mm -hmm. Because being in gymnastics and coaching gymnastics, mm -hmm. I've been around kids and kids, gymnasts yeah. all the time. The most flexible time, that, yeah. you know, is when you're a kid. You yeah, know? and so when I started those martial arts and more into the stunt training myself, then I was like, ah, oh, this isn't normal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's awesome you trying to help uh, people in that regard. And uh, is there any other plans that you have or...? Still coaching. I love the mm. coaching. Again, another passion of the, mine. That's the na um, national team? Or the yeah, New so team. Mm. I have a bunch of girls that were meant to go to Worlds this year. That but, yeah, didn't happen. Unfortunately, mm. Worlds got cancelled. It's supposedly been postponed, but... Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Really see. We can't plan anything, so mm. I'm just training the girls for competitions that we don't know are happening. Mm. But I still love doing that, yeah. And... Um, what about like a uh, stunt wise? Like, um, I mean, you can't really name. I understand you, you're not supposed to name where you're working at the moment or what you're filming for, but like, would you say you're pretty busy this year? You know, looking at next year, it's going to be quite busy or? It was a very, very quiet year this year. Mm -hmm. um, definitely had to find some temp work mm -hmm. in between, which is quite disheartening after you put that much time yeah. into like, oh, I feel like I'm going backwards, but you know, it's just, the time but recently uh probably pretty much straight straight after the first lockdown things started to pick up and then second lockdown hit and things got shut down again but they didn't get shut down for as long and so as soon as the second lockdown was over things were like back straight away mm -hmm. and i was straight into a full week of work as soon as we hit level two in wow. Auckland. <laughs> yeah and i was just like oh my gosh i'm not ready for this <laughs> What do we have to do again? And then all the new COVID protocols and everything as well. I was oh, like, oh. Yeah. Mm. Um, so it was, it was good. And it's mm. been consistent since. So I'm not full time on a job right now. I'm just bouncing between productions. And since the second lockdown, I've worked on five productions, possibly six. Wow. I've lost count. Just bouncing between them all, like a couple of days here, 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 and just jumping around. Mm. Uh, and most of them, don't break until December. So right before Christmas is when they have a break and then mm. they'll be back in January. Well, that's so good. At least, busy like, again. yeah, at least it's, you know, it's busy and it's going to be for a while, hopefully. Um, Fingers crossed. Yeah, so more opportunities for yourself and the people who are in your industry, yeah. you know. Um, okay, so now we've come to the section, wise words from the wise lady. So tell us, um, one of our, I don't, I don't know if you've seen one of our guests, he actually, um, he gave some wise words and then someone else actually made it like an official thing. So it's like an ongoing thing. 
<laughs> so yeah, some what, wise words. Yeah, yeah, what would you you know what would you uh, what are some advice you would give to people who are watching listening? It can be anything. It doesn't have to be like you know uh, mm. any particular. Topic I'm trying to think or... about the thing that I say most to people is, um, don't let your fear get in the way. Mm. I think a lot of people fear certain things. Whether it could be fearing failure, it could be anything, but really you never know till you try mm -hmm. like as weird as that sounds i mean i work in an industry where if someone jumped into my spot they would be scared every second of every day possibly but fear is often it just gets in the way it's a natural reaction to the unknown and you know I'm trying to think of a really good way to explain this and it's not coming to me right now it's okay you can take, you can take <laughs> the time you can take <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, I see it, it stops people from progressing and it mm. stops people from learning and people just stay where they're comfortable and fear is often the barrier to that and I think if you can overcome your own fear and the barriers that you put in your own head, you will achieve so much more but it really comes down to just not accepting it and going, okay, I acknowledge that that fear is real, it's there and then just pushing it to a side and getting on with doing it. Mm. Yeah. That is some very wise words. <laughs> yeah, for someone who can put it together, you actually put it really well. Um, that's awesome. I think, um, yeah, a lot of people can uh, benefit from, you know, just your experience and, you know, your the stuff that you've been through. And obviously, you know, with like, you know, us talking about this whole stunt work and stuff like that, like, it's really cool. Like, you know, it's what, what I said earlier, you know, like you don't really meet people in this industry often or, you know, like or hear how about them. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm sure there are people who, um, who want to get into this line and don't know what to do or where mm. to go and stuff like that. So, I mean, you've kind of set like a rough, you know, a, a framework for them to start with something, you know, yeah. with the guild, with the stunt school and stuff like that. So, you've got to start somewhere, right? Yeah, so, I mean, there's there's options there and they can pursue that if they want to. Um, yeah, I think we, we're about almost hour and a half in. That's awesome. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. We just like <laughs> Sorry for that. We just cruise <laughs> fast the whole thing. Um, but yeah, anyway, I just want to say thank you for your time today um, doing a podcast with us and I want to wish you all the best uh, for all your future endeavors, um, you know, with your, co your coaching, your stunt work and you know, all the other stuff that you do on the side. Because apparently, yeah. like, you do a lot of things. Like to stay yeah. busy. Yeah. <laughs> you do, like, a lot of things. So, <laughs> um, you know, and also at the same time, like, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, just to share, like, you know, as much as we all have, I think this is not just, like, for us, but for people who are watching as well, as much as everybody has a lot of things and you're always diving into, like, so many things at once, like, I think it's very important for us to always have some time for ourselves as well because mm. sometimes we get too busy we go into a lot of stuff and we forget about our own selves and our own mental health and stuff like that so i mean there's something to look into as well um for people really watching true. yeah and for me as well you know <laughs> um so yeah thank you for your time again uh, bronte and uh, yeah wish you all the best thanks for That's having me from us today see you guys on the next one see ya for watching this episode don't forget to subscribe like and share and see you on the next one